Welcome to the Faster Podcast by Flow Cycling, the podcast where we talk about anything and everything that makes you faster on your bike. This is Season 1, Episode 12, and today we have Ryan Cooper from Training Peaks joining us on the show. Ryan, an advisor to many pro tour cycling teams, is the co-founder of Best Bike Split and one of the brightest cycling scientists in the world. Listen to this episode to learn how to optimize your equipment, bike fit, and race plan to become a faster cyclist. All right. So, Mr. Ryan Cooper, welcome to the show. How are you doing today, man? Hey, great. It's good to be here. Awesome. Where are you Where are you today? So, I am uh, at my house in wonderful Temple, Texas. Um, not really sure there's anything super exciting to say about it, but... Uh, <laughs> It's 75 degrees, so that's that's not bad. So at least the, that ain't bad the weather's at all. nice. Yeah, that's good. Well, you you may not live in a super exciting area, but I can say that what you bring to the table in the world of cycling is is very exciting stuff, and that's why we have you on the show today. Um, for those of you who don't know Ryan, you definitely should. Um, John and I are both math. Uh, engineers. So math was always a strong suit for us. But if you compare the math that Ryan does to what we did in college, it would probably be like first grade math compared to <laughs> calculus. Um, a, a famous story. And, you know, this story could be like a fish story. So maybe the fish is a lot bigger than what it was when it was originally caught. But Ryan, you can confirm this. Um, years ago, so Ryan developed this super cool mathematic algorithm that predicts a cyclist time on a course um, based on wattage inputs that he gives you. So you give them, you give an FTP, he spits out a bunch of intervals that you should hold during different sections of the course, and he is deadly accurate. So the Trek team on the tour was trying to develop a similar system and had multiple scientists working on it. And I believe it took about six hours for their system to calculate a rider's output. Ryan could do the same thing in a fraction of a second. And from what I hear, yours was a better prediction of their actual time and more accurate. So that ended you, that got you to the tour a few times. Is that right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's right. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, in, I think we were, we were still in beta phase, um, towards the end of 2013 and got contacted, um, by Trek, by their engineering team, actually first um and they were interested in comparing the model to their to their model in house and um i wouldn't say that ours was extremely uh more accurate than theirs they they have a really really good model and in fact some of their stuff was uh we kind of helped each other out a little bit on on some places but time wise uh just their approach to how how they were running the model at the time compared to to our approach was a uh, there was some significant time differences. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> All right. Sweet. Ryan, so Ryan's, we got, Ryan's also very modest if you've not picked this up. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. So we, we've we got a certified next level genius on the show today. And if you're in Kona and you want to go to a hell of a party, he knows how to throw one because they always have uh, De Pokey Shack Poke at the Training Peaks party. So uh, we got a lot to cover today and I figure we might as well just jump right into it. So we're basically going to take all of Ryan's computational data that he does, and we're going to look at how, what he can analyze with wheels, different components, bike fit, and look at how much time we can save by changing things. Let's start obviously with wheels. I mean, what else would we start with? <laughs> so uh, what, what depth wheels, Ryan, do you recommend for different types of racing? Some people believe that you should have different types for time trial or crit racing or hill climbs. Uh, we always kind of believe that aerodynamics trump weight in most regards. So what would you suggest a cyclist use for racing? And do you suggest different types of wheels for different types of events? Yeah. So, I mean, uh, ideally, you know, kind of perfect world, you would have your whole set of every potential option, right? Um, so meaning depth from anywhere from 30, um, you know, up to 90, 90 plus, plus a disc on the back. Um, and, and there is some, you know, slight variance between different types of races, different distances, different conditions. If you look at something like Kona, um, and you, you maybe saw what, uh, Cameron Wharf was able to do and he had a pretty shallow front, front wheel. He made that decision, uh, on purpose, uh, for the crosswinds coming off, uh, Javi. But, um, you know, yes, for a crit or for something like that, you may want a wheel, that's not quite as deep that you could accelerate if you're a sprinter. Um, but you know, for the most part, if you're going to have one set, one wheel, all the wheels are so 
so comparable these days, like a Shimano 60 and a Shimano 90, there was almost no difference in the wind tunnel between <laughs> the two, right? So, um, so you kind of look at that or, or you guys, you know, 45, um, would be another really good, good kind of all around option that you would use yep. for every, for every race almost, you know? Um, so yeah, I mean, I mean, I think there, there are, if you're doing a pure climbing, that's a 6% average grade the whole way. Um, and you're going to be sitting there at 12 to 13 miles an hour, then yeah, you're going to, the weight could come into, you know, into, could come into play there. And so you'd, you'd probably go lightest weight, um, with, you know, maybe a narrow, narrow width, uh, or, you know, kind of a minimal width on it. Um, but you know, once you're past that, then aerodynamics is going to, going to trump pretty much every time. Um, the only caveat being if there's tons of turns and you're having to constantly accelerate, decelerate, accelerate, decelerate, then, you know, you may not want to go with the, the, the deepest that you possibly could. Yeah. And that's kind of cool because we did that. So we've done a few studies now where we compare arrow to weight. And what we found is that unless you're strictly climbing the Alpe d'Huez and there's no other course before or after aerodynamics pretty much always win. And, and it's interesting because we couldn't find a single triathlon course in the world where weight was more important than aerodynamics. So it's just, that really plays into what you're saying. Yeah. yeah I think, uh, th Oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say the other thing is, is that you mentioned how, you know, 60 millimeter wheels and 90 millimeter wheels are, are starting to merge. And, and the reality is, is that's true. I mean, our most recent um, development project that we've gone through where we took all of those 110,000 data points and then used optimization algorithms to, to sort of come up with our rim shapes. We gave that optimization algorithm a number of depth ranges that it could search in. And we also gave it a number of width constraints. And those width constraints were wider than what you would typically see in, in a sort of a traditional wheel. But because of that width, you can get a lot more aerodynamic benefit out of a wheel. And so even though on paper, our Flow 90 is is faster than our Flow 60, it's marginal. I mean, over a over a, an Ironman, you're looking at a matter of seconds where before it used to be upwards of, of minutes for that different depth. So you're 100% right. Yeah, and I think um, you kind of start to see that convergence uh, between all the brands as well, right? So um, yeah. you see it in frames as, uh, also, but yeah. <laughs> uh, on the wheel side, you know, you all of the top end wheels are so good and uh, you know, so then it comes down to, well, you know, what, do I, what is it that I'm really looking at? And so on a price price point, it's hard to beat you guys, obviously, but you know, the, <laughs> the aerodynamics between a Bontrager and an Envy and a Shimano, the new Shimano's are really good. Um, you know, those things, they're all fairly marginal in that, yep. in that kind of difference range. Nice. Perfect. So this is a interesting question we get a lot. Now we have our own recommendation for this, but if an athlete is on a budget and they can only afford one reel, one wheel, so it could be a front wheel, it could be a rear wheel, uh, where would they put their money? What would you recommend? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. And, and it goes back, <laughs> it's, it's interesting because I remember a long time ago, uh, I, my very first, maybe my second triathlon ever, it was just a sprint distance. And I remember seeing this guy that was out there, he's probably 18, and he had his bike all set up and it was just, you know, a regular tube steel bike and the back wheel was just a regular spoke training wheel and the front wheel he had a head three and i always remember i was like what what is he doing <laughs> and he demolished everybody on the bike i don't know if that had anything to do with it but but he i do remember he was at least five minutes ahead of everybody and then i realized he also ran like a 15 minute 5k off the bike and, oh, okay. one of those guys huh? he's just he's just really good um but you know it's it is interesting i think like depending on what your, your initial set is, you know, the, the wind's going to hit the, the front wheel first, right? So it's going to have right. kind of the biggest impact. However, um, if you think about like discs, uh, for instance, and, and how, when you're designing a frame nowadays, you're designing a lot of it with wheels in mind, right? So it's not just, it's not just the frame in a vacuum, right? They have the whole system that they're kind of yep. looking yeah. at. So part of that is, saying, okay, you, your front wheel is going to break up some of this wind and how can I try and get as much flow to get back together as fast as possible later on in the system? So exactly. then, you know, you're, then a disc, you know, starts to really kind of play, play a, a key role. If you're testing a disc by itself, you're going to see that yaw angle, you know, it's going to spike up pretty heavy. There's going to be a kind of a key area where it's the best. 
But when you think about it in terms of a full system, you already have that turbulent air coming and then it's trying to smooth it back out over the backside of the the system. So, um, you know, I I would used to say you'd you'd want the front wheel, um, but depending on the position in the bike, um, you know, it it may be that the, the back part would help bring that, bring that air back together a little cleaner on the, on the other side. My answer is always a bit of a cheater answer. So I always say go for, <laughs> go for, go for front wheel, but mm-hmm. if you can only afford one wheel, pick up an arrow uh, jacket, arrow cover. Yeah. If you can do an arrow jacket back for that very reason. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so then you kind of get the best of both worlds. And then when you've got money for the rear wheel, you can, you can go out and do that. So yeah. that's, that's a great, that, that's a great yeah. cheater answer. I like it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm going to steal it. I'm going to start saying that that's, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be on our um, FAQ tomorrow. Yes. Yes. You just brought up some, uh, discussion about frames and wheel interaction. And so, you know, some of the stuff that we've started to recognize and look at is, is frame and wheel interaction and specifically the actual, the amount of space that you have between a wheel and the frame itself. So Mm -hmm. can you discuss a little bit the impact that frames can have on the aero benefits or the, how it can take away from the aero benefit of a wheel? Yeah. I mean, in the, the old days, I think it was quite a bit bigger impact. So before you, when you had either non-aerodynamic frames or you had aerodynamic frames that were created kind of by themselves without the wheel interaction being, you know, thought about. Um, then it was, you know, you kind of hit or miss on, uh, well, we want to get it as close as you possibly can. So you had the old, like, tr- uh, I think it was felt frames and you could push it right up there, you know, into the kind yep. of the, <laughs> had one of those. The, <laughs> where it would start rubbing and you're like, oh no. And, and so like you had all that and then Trek with the speed concept showed that, Hey, you can use real, um, you know, use real hangers and have a little bit of a gap but we design, you know, they designed the frame to do that. Right. So yep, to have exactly. a little gap in it, not to, to have an impact. Um, and so, yeah, I remember again, back, back when I was first aerodynamics were kind of like really taking kind of mainstream. So you'd take a, you would take like a credit card or something and see if you could put it in between the wheel and the, you know, the space or whatever. <laughs> and and nowadays they, they design it so well that it like, you know, that that's kind of taken into account. Um, same thing yeah. with tires and the, you know, the, the wider wheels and losing that seam that you would have in there. So it's kind of a seamless path between the frame to the tire, to the wheel. Um, the yep. front end probably has a bigger, bigger impact on that, right? Cause you, you don't have that buffer zone to try and smooth the air out. So it's just going to hit that raw. So that's where, you know, wider wheels, wider tire, those start to really have a a pretty big benefit. Definitely. Definitely. So we just talked about how aerodynamics was more important than weight, but can you discuss how much more important it is? Sure. (laughs) So that's where some of the math comes in, which is kind of nice. So, um, in, like you're saying, Jim, uh, you know, taking us the real world, we do it on the math side, but we like to model the real world, you know, via math. So, um, you know, not just looking at, um, you know, a lot of studies or 40 K time trial, this is going to save you X amount of time. And you're like, well, yeah, maybe if, you know, the bike <laughs> and the wheels are going by themselves and there's no rider on it and it's a perfectly constant wind and all this. So, uh, we try and like bring some reality to, to the modeling part. Um, and so for instance, on like a Kona course, which is, you know, something iconic that we like to, to think about. Um, which does have quite a bit of climbing in it. I think it's somewhere near 4,000 feet, maybe more, um, or at least somewhere in that ballpark. Um, and so you kind of look at that course and say, well, let's use a typical age group, strong age group riders, aerodynamic values that weighs around 160 pounds. And so if I said that we're going to add 10 pounds to that, so, um, 10 pounds over Kona at the same kind of wattage, let's say 200 Watts, um, is about three and a half minutes roughly. Mm. So if you think about 10 pounds is three and a half minutes. Okay. So that's quite a bit, um, to lose (laughs) or to gain. Right. So if I was 160 and then I wanted, I wanted to get to 150, I may not be able to get there. Right. So I mean, that's 6% of my body weight or whatever. So, um, you know, and I'm only gaining three minutes by losing that 
that much time or three and a half minutes roughly. So yep. you go, okay, well, what if I could get more aerodynamic? So if I was just kind of a middle, you know, age grouper, still a strong age grouper, but my aerodynamics were such that, you know, I have plenty of room for improvement, which most, most people, almost every triathlete I've seen does have room for improvement. So, <laughs> um, so let's look at like the percentage that you can drop. So if you drop 4%, let's say you go, and I'm trying not to get too nerdy on the numbers, but you go from a 0.25 <laughs> CDA to a 0.45 CDA, you know, you're looking at that same three and a half minutes, right? And two, that's two, really five, not really two. that hard to do. So, I mean, that's the difference of, you know, a, a mediocre position to a somewhat better mediocre position. Right? So you're saying from a 0.25 to a 0.245 is the same amount of time? So point, uh, sorry, 0.255 to a 0.45. So about wow. a 0.1 difference, which, you know, is to try to put that in perspective, um, you know, that would be the difference of staying aerodynamic 10% longer, right? Or something like that, 5% yeah. longer on a course. It's, wow. So don't look around as much when you drink so, the water. So if that's an average position, what, what kind of type of CDA can most athletes attain? Um, so if you look at the pro pro level, so somebody like a Sebastian Keenle or, um, a Josh Amberger, who's really, really a small, kind of a small dude, um, you know, they're down in that 0.23 range. So Keenley is obviously much bigger, but he's very long, streamlined. So <laughs> he's, uh, yeah, it's crazy how he fits. He, he gets really, really <laughs> low. Um, but even, you know, even uh, Fredano too, like he's really 6'5, but he has a dialed in position. He wears the long sleeve arrow suit. Um, yeah. His helmet's always really streamlined on his back. So, you know, you're looking at a 0.235 there, even at five, you know, 6'5. Um, so those numbers wow. are, are kind of the range for an age grouper though. You could still get into that 0.235, 0.24 range. Um, I mean, we have time trials when you go to that side, um, working with a guy in the office here at training peaks or in training peaks, uh, up in Boulder and he's down at like a 0.19 and he, wow. I mean, and that's a legitimate point. <laughs> wow. Uh, and he is dialed in, uh, like. Almost nobody I've seen. <laughs> so, yeah, you just so, got to breathe on the pedals to win that. Uh, yeah, I mean, he got. <laughs> I, he's he's shooting for Masters TT champ, U.S. Masters TT champ next year. Wow, think, so. wow, wow! So, so one one point I'll make here is that anybody who's listening, who's wondering what CDA is, uh, hmm. CDA is it's two things multiplied together. CD is your coefficient of drag, which is basically how arrow you are, how easily the air moves over a body. So the lower that number, the more aerodynamic something is. A is just the cross-sectional area of the thing moving through the air. So if you were to imagine looking at a cyclist coming straight at you, that whatever you would see is a, is a 2D area, that would be their cross-sectional area. So when you multiply hmm. those two things together, you get what's called your CDA value. And the lower that CDA value the less drag you produce, which means the faster you go. So what Ryan is saying is as you go from a 0.255 down to a 0.245, that makes you faster by the amount of time that he described. So just a quick and side. And also note. just to, to kind of throw in there that um, part of the reason that CDA is such a big thing and aerodynamic drag is such a big thing is that when you're looking at your power equations, that it's exponential. So the faster exactly. you go the harder it is to overcome the speed that you're going. So, um, whereas weight really comes into play in terms of gravity and it comes into play in terms of your rolling resistance. So the kind of being able to push yourself over it, um, and that only increases linear, um, with speed. So you look at those two things. And so the faster you go, the more drag, you know, plays a, a huge part in, in the power that you're putting out. Nice. Exactly. And like Ryan says, it's nonlinear. If you look at the drag equation, if you look, it's one half row CDA and then times your velocity. So that's the only thing that we really need to focus on is that velocity, but that velocity value is squared. So anytime you increase speed, you're actually going up by a square value as opposed to linear. So that's why it becomes so incredibly important. Nice. Nice. Um, but before we jump into, I want to talk about fit, but before we jump into that, Ryan, you kind of touched on a point that I've been saying for years. And I always say that 95% of the gain that people get from race wheels 
comes from changing from your stock training wheels to an aero wheel in general. And people always say, well, how much better is Zip or is Zip better than Envy? Is Envy better than you? And really, when you get into that higher level of wheel, the difference between, in my opinion, between us and Zip and Envy or Head, those differences are so small. And and the test that you do, if we use a specific tire on our wheel, then in one situation, we may be a little faster uh, than Zip. But if you use another tire at a different pressure, even Zip could beat us out in another test. Can You, you can confirm that, would you say? Yeah, for sure. The definite biggest boost of anything is yeah if you you make that first going from training training wheel to any kind of aero wheel or going from a round tube bike road bike sitting straight up to any kind of aerodynamic bike where your position is having to change like those kind of things that first that first order move is the biggest bang for your buck right yep. Yep. and then after that yeah like you're saying it's i mean it's fairly negligible um and there is some you know depending on the type of race and those kind of things there may be some little variations between the 60 and the 90 or the 45 you know the, between those kind of distances uh, or sorry uh, win, uh rim widths but it's it's starting to get to where it's very very negligible and now yeah. just like on the frame side it's um envy versus you guys versus the head and you're talking about when you look at it in the complete system you're talking about you know fractions and fractions of a second there yep. yeah yeah interesting okay so you talked about fit a little bit in that last answer and that kind of leads <clears throat> us into our next point so just in general going from a road bike an upright fit on a road bike to a let's say decent time trial fit how many watts can an athlete save all right i'm gonna yeah, I'm going to use the math right now to do it. Yeah, let's count. do it. So, Perfect. <laughs> uh, I'll go from like a, a typical road bike fit, right? So, yeah. you know, you're kind of up on the hoods or whatever, right? So, if you go from a typical road bike fit, and we'll talk about his watts at Kona. Um, so, you go from a typical road bike fit to what we call a decent, uh, you know, decent aerodynamic position, meaning like you go to a fitter and they get you in a position and you're, yep. you know, you can stay in it for the whole time. Let's put it that way. Yep. Sure. Um, so you're looking at, oh man, I don't know if my chart is going to go down that far. <laughs> uh, it's, you know, it's, it's on a 200 watt type athlete, you're looking at 40 watts almost. Oh, <laughs> 40 watts. Yeah. Wow. So and, and 16, that trans- I mean, almost like, I guess it'd be not quite 20%, but something like that. And how many minutes does that equate to? Um, so that was, let me look here. At There's a always Kona that. Cra- course, so yeah, the Kona type of course. Um, oh man, you're looking at, let me click it down. I'm using our own app while I'm doing this. So. Okay. All right. It's <laughs> awesome. Um, There's so many ways to calculate yeah, so the it's time almost, I mean, it's, it'd be like more than 30 minutes. Oh my gosh. That's crazy. Okay. So we went from road bike to, you know, decent tri bike fit. How we, and we talked about this a bit, but if we look at it in terms of Watts and then minutes, Mm -hmm. let's go from a, you just buy a time trial bike and a lot of people get the time trial bike and they think, Oh, that's all I need, but they can be in a really bad position. So let's take an athlete from a bad position on a time trial bike or a triathlon bike and put them in that decent position. How many Watts and time can that save you on a course like Kona? Cool. Yeah. So again, if we do a bad position, it's going to be potentially better than hopefully better than your road bike position yeah (laughs) um maybe not that much better um but you're looking at like uh like somewhere between a 15 minute difference just between those two positions wow Um, and watts wise um, 20 watts yeah so watts wise it's gonna be yeah almost a little over 20 watts so jeez jeez jeez. okay all right so now this is the thing with with aerodynamics and we've learned this in the tunnel i mean we take we take a wheel with the exact same tire, exact same wheel. We change the PSI by five points and mm-hmm. you see a huge difference in the error results. So humans with different parts and pieces and components add that variability or take that variability to the nth degree. So knowing that, are there any general fit tips that you have seen like your hand position or mm. bottle positions or helmets that you could give athletes that seem to work in almost every situation. Sure. Um, so 
<laughs> like you said earlier, most people, they get the tri bike and they get the aero helmet and they go, all right, now I'm set. I'm going to be so much faster. <laughs> uh, you may feel faster. I don't know. But, um, and it's, it's, I always kind of like the eyeball test too. It's like you look at it and you go, the more I look like this person, so the more I look like Keenley and the less I look like, you know, somebody in a, like a barn door, or, you know, yes. like the less, yeah. the less I look like I'm on the cart with the, the basket in front and I've like got the old school cruiser bike, um, the faster it's going to be. Um, I unfortunately look like I'm sitting on the cruiser bike and I'm <laughs> going to get groceries. But, um, but yeah, so I look at old pictures of myself and I go, whoa, I am way off. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I mean, I would say the best advice that somebody gave me was, you know, Get into an arrow position, especially for Ironman, half Ironman type of stuff. Get into an arrow position where you're low, you're and you're tight, meaning you're you know you're getting your your arms in as much as you can. But make sure it's comfortable. Make sure you can stay in that position because if you right. can't stay in the position, it's not going to be arrow at all, right? So right, no, right. Um, so you get in the lowest, longest, tightest position that you can comfortably stay in for the five hours or five and a half hours. Um, that you're going to be out there. Um, and every time you look up, every time you look around, every time you sit up to take a drink, it's like a stopwatch and you're losing time. And so just think about it that way. Just kind of yeah. get your mind to stay down as, as much as you can. And that's the first step, right? And then from there, once you can get comfortable, you can start working on it. And um, from what we've seen working with um, GC, the the guy in the office, um, is as he's gotten progressively... Uh, more and more aerodynamic, um, we've we've started to see that the trend kind of converges. So if you are going for the most aerodynamic position you can, and we see this in the wind tunnel as well, um, you know the low, flat, long as you can be, and then hand position slightly up. So don't have the scoop effect. You know you used to see Cadell Evans or somebody out there, and and even Cancellara would have their arms straight down, right? Um, yeah. So you have this huge scoop. And so, you know, anything, there's kind of marginal gain from what we've seen from um, slightly above center line to praying mantis. You know, there doesn't seem to be any difference there, but there is, starts to be a difference the lower you go with your own. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. Very cool. Similar with, with helmet. It's so, so kind of individual um, that you want a helmet that, you know, if you look around a lot, then you probably want a snub nose type of helmet. If you... Um, can keep it flat and straight and streamlined with the rest of your body, then, you know, a longer tail can work as well. But, um, again, it's so dependent on the type of riding you do and what you see. If you go to the wind tunnel, you may see something there that in the real world, you don't actually do what you did <laughs> in the tunnel. Yes. So you see nice. that a lot actually. So, huh. Man, um, you're making this transition super easy because our next topic is helmets. So you, oh, yeah. like, <laughs> right yeah. Yeah. it's like, you know, <laughs> you know. easier. Yeah. So let's talk about how much, how much time can, let's say I got like an old bell, you know, cruiser helmet versus mm -hmm. an aero helmet. What, what kind of time can the right helmet save me? Uh, I mean, it can save quite a bit. We went to, um, so I was with the United Healthcare, um, cycling team last year. We went to their aero camp, um, and did tunnel testing, then real world testing, then tunnel, then real world and kind of back and forth with both the men and women's side. And what was really interesting is they all had the same helmet, but you could see that like in the tunnel, certain athletes that rode a certain way, um, had better, I guess it worked better for them than others. So we had one yeah. athlete that in the tunnel kept their head in the perfect position. But of course, when they went outside, they were basically looking straight down in the tunnel when they went outside, they had to see where they were going. So they changed the position of the helmet <laughs> and it was about a 3% difference almost. Wow. Like, yeah. Somewhere around there, like two, 2.8 2 or something. Um, just because their head was in a different position. Right. So, um, they were extremely aerodynamic in the tunnel. Um, and they were still really aerodynamic out, but there was a significant difference to it. Um, and so that gets into the trick of, if you if you're like us and the real people and trying to buy <laughs> trying to buy equipment, um, you we can't go buy everything and test it all. So, what would be kind of the best way to to go? Um, and I would again say like just look at the type of riding you do. 
And do you tend to look around a lot? Does your neck tend to hurt? You know, are you riding long distance Ironman stuff versus yeah. are you riding really short time trials? Um, yeah. Yeah, so, but, t- but in general, yeah, I would say somewhere between, I mean, like almost a point one point oh one difference on... Uh, wow. And that's it, watts and time-wise, that's what? Uh, so it'd be the same as... It'd be like three, well, almost five minutes or so, three and a half to five minutes on, a, on an Ironman. And that's worth what? Uh, 10 watts? Uh, let's see. Well, it'd actually be less than that. It'd be yeah, seven watts? Probably seven, eight. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Okay. It's interesting you you bring that up because you know the time that we spend in a tunnel, you know, you get into a lot of conversations, and some of the things that you hear are that, you know, helmets work on specific people, and a lot of that, from my understanding, is the way that the the airflow moves over the helmet and then trails off into the body. Mm-hmm. Um, but what you're saying is that when people get on the out in the real world, like that's totally different you know they may look around i mean i can imagine i can imagine <laughs> yeah, my father like when my father drives a car i don't think he looks straight ahead for more than two minutes like for an hour drive so <laughs> right he would be a guy who would need like a stubby helmet i think that would probably yeah. be good for him well if you you look at some athlete look at um you know for anybody that's, that's listening you can go on and just kind of search for different athletes and look at how their their position is and you look at like a starkey who for you know whether you like him or not you look at his position it's pretty dialed in he's pretty low, yeah. he's pretty low low pretty flat and he has that long tail helmet and it's just pressed against his back the whole time right he, he even sprints in the aero position somehow so um it's it's interesting to see that versus you know some of these other athletes that that'll look around and um you also want to look at the the course that you're on so if you're being aerodynamic is great but if you're physio physiologically if you're pushing it harder than you can you're not getting air ventilation you're not doing that then you know your your race may be over before it even starts right so exactly um definitely looking at the race and saying maybe i should even if it's five hours and i'm gonna save three minutes but i'm gonna walk the whole run then maybe it's worth me losing that three to five minutes in you know keeping cool throughout the race yeah exactly so is there a i mean if you're not gonna if you don't have the money to go to a tunnel you don't have all this time to test is there a general rule of thumb, like a stumpier, a shorter, stubbier helmet's better than a long one for most athletes? I would think so, just because I, I think that for the most part, you know, most athletes are not going to be in a, get into the very low, low position where a long okay. tail helmet's going to, you know, play a huge dividend. And now you kind of see these medium range ones or even, I think yeah. the old selector, I can't remember. Some of them had interchangeable parts, right? Where yeah, yeah, change, yeah. Yep. Change the back. And I think Smith even has that on theirs too. Yeah. Cool. Um, but I think like this kind of trend has been to go, you know, more snub over the, uh, the past nice. uh, five years. So I would, I would suggest cool. that. Yeah. Cool. All right. You mentioned earlier when we were talking about uh, CDAs and some of the top pros, you talked about Jan Ferdano and how he has a, he uses the full length skin suit and that kind of leads into our mm-hmm. next topic and that's race suits and skin suits. So how much of an effect can your race suit have on your performance? So, um, you know, I don't have a lot of data on it. I will say when we went, um, again, last year, everybody tested in the skin suit in the tunnel. Then we went out and one day it was really, really cold. So they, uh, one of the riders didn't want to do their outdoor test in their skin suit. So they rode, they rode with a tight you know, it's still a tight, but it was more thermal tight kind of top. Yep. Um, and it was a 10% difference. On oh, so they still had fabric over their body. Yep. But it was still long diff- sleeve and it was still fairly tight. However, not super tight. <laughs> you can see it flapping a little bit. Let's put it that way. 10% of their drag? Yeah. Wow. wow. Okay, big. so there's this whole thing, skin or no skin. Um, some people go sleeved or sleeveless. Is that that much of a difference as well? Um, it, no, it's not going to be that much of a difference, but there is still a difference. Again, using GC, who, um, as an example there in, in Boulder, he's now on a full sleeve with full arrow gloves, and you know he's seen a, a mark... You, an improvement that you can actually measure time, you know, over time. So you can still see that on average, he's, he's same exact position as he was. And he's the data showing that he's more aerodynamic than, than he was the same time last year. So cover up your skin is what you're saying. If you can. Wow. Awesome. Okay. 
And then when it comes to race suits and skin suits, what's, what are some of the biggest mistakes you see athletes making when they do select a race suit? Well, so yeah, then it, then it gets down to, you know, very nuanced things, the wrinkle stuff. Is it, you know, are you going to overheat in it? You know, so those kind of things you see some mistakes, people just trying to get so aerodynamic. And again, if I was just starting off skin suits, not the first thing that I would worry about. I'd go position (laughs) first and then work on dialing in my position Yep. Then, you know, equipment and then start to like ease into that aero helmet, then work on once you, there's no more gain to be had, you know, in terms of huge, huge gains, <laughs> then yeah. you start to look at, you know, uh speed suit versus a tight regular suit. Yeah. Um, Race suits made from shark skin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, but yeah, so like I, there is, there is a, an, a difference where you can measure it. Right. But, um, but you, you know, it's, those things are so, they, they get so marginal when it's full sleeve versus three quarter sleeve versus, you know, even okay. sleeveless. But, um, I would say that you almost see every top pro triathlete going at least quarter sleeve, I think now. So yeah, yeah um, they do because there is, there is a, a difference and then it's just, are you comfortable and making sure you don't overheat and those kind of things. And it looks awesome. cool. Yeah. yeah, it does. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about uh, hydration. So you look at bikes, you've got, you know, traditionally, if you look at old bikes, they had the down tube, the aluminum cage water bottle, that uh, big round bottle. You started mm-hmm. getting things that were moving behind the seat. You've got new bikes like the Ventum One, which has got an in- integrated bottle. Um, where's the best place for us to put our hydration? Is it different for every rider? And what kind of an effect can we see uh, with yeah. hydration? Um, so this is an area that I'd, I want to do more research on. I, I don't have a lot of good data on it, okay. um, but I will say the best place to put the nutrition for a long course athlete is where you can actually get to it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Ryan, you, stop making so much sense. <laughs> so you, you don't. Yeah. So I remember I was racing somewhere and they had cobblestones, Belgium, and they had cobblestones. And I had my nutrition and I was all set up and it was between the, it was back when they had the, uh, oh, I can't remember what the name of the bottle was, but it was those big aero bottles that would sit in front and kind of act like yep. a fairing almost. Um, yep. and, and so I'm sitting there and the first time I hit the cobbles, it's off. <laughs> it's <laughs> gone. <laughs> and of course I had no bottle cages for backup water or anything like that. And I was like, well, that's great. So, um, <laughs> Yeah. So wherever, wherever you can actually get to it and it stays on the bike is good. Uh, but I think between, you know, some companies, so you look at Cervelo, like they built the beam bike P5, whatever it's called, um, the X P5 X or whatever. Um, they built that with water bottles in mind, right? So they knew they built it where you have the water bottle, I think two behind or one below and one between and one behind or whatever it is. But they had plenty of places for water and, uh, and nutrition, and they did that on purpose, right? Um, so I think, like, you know, you start to see whatever the bike manufacturer, as you get into these higher-end bikes, they're, that's a big part of their thought process is not just how do we make it as aerodynamic po- as possible, how do we make it accessible and as aerodynamic as possible? So Canyon, you know, has it up front. Um, Ventum has it built in. Um, so you're going to, I think that integration point is going to be the most, you know, beneficial. And then as you start to go down, um, some bikes like Pinarello and stuff have, have built it to where they've designed for that round bottle as part of the down tube. Really? So, um, you know, so they, they've kind of thought through that and and maybe it has a bigger cam tail or whatever. So it, it allows the air to flow over it a little bit. In the old days, you had a round tube, and then you put a round tube on a round tube, and it's still all aero, not, none of it's aerodynamic, so it didn't really matter. So, um, it's our the airflow is already all messed up and not going to streamline back anyway. So, um, yeah, I would think like you would down tube would probably be better because you've hit the you've hit the front of the wheel. You've your air is already dirty anyway. Then by the time it can start to hit some of the 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 seat tube maybe it can start to kind of flow back together a little bit better yeah um so i would just logically think the down tube would probably be better than the seat tube for a round bottle i was gonna ask you like the 
biggest common mistake athletes make when placing hydration, but I think you already answered that one. Like, yeah, wherever I put it, don't do, don't put it. (laughs) (laughs) It's funny you say that. I remember I, I was on a uh, slow twitch one day on the forums and some guy was like asking about how to set up his flats, like his spares Mm -hmm. for a race. And some of the guys had these most elaborate systems for flats and Josh Portner you know, master of all wisdom, uh, gets on the form and he's just like, guys, you actually have to be able to change your tire. And he gave like the most logical, like most common sense answer. And this guy starts arguing with him and I call Josh or something after. I'm just like, dude, sometimes you just can't win. Like yeah. there's nothing you can do. It's, so. the, it's duct taped or it's the, yeah, you've got, I've got it duct taped between this and this. Yeah. And else, you know. It takes me an hour to change my tire. Right. Yeah, it's so right. dumb. Yeah. At that point, you just might as well wait for the spare wheel car to come exactly. back and be good. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Let's talk about some accessories and some extras, something mm-hmm. like uh, shoe covers. Do they really save time? What's your what's your take on shoe covers? I, I don't know. Like you see, I, I guess in the, I don't know if in the hour record, they maybe they're not allowed to have them. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but I remember, you know, watching Wiggins on, on his hour and I think he had long socks, but I don't think he had, uh, he didn't have any shoe covers, but it may be that they don't allow it. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, I, I think it does, does make some difference. Um, you know, that your legs aren't static, so they're moving. So it complicates everything a little bit, right? So yes, very um, much so. How much it, you know, how much it matters, you know, it's going to probably be less than a skin suit, right? So yep. um, it's lower than, you know, it's lower. The air is already turbulent. You're moving. Your legs are. So yeah, I mean, I, I would just think that it's going to be fairly marginal. Um, but you know, that's probably something that somebody studied somewhere. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what about I would think because it's moving, it's a little, probably a little marginalized. What about something that's static and up front like gloves? Have you looked at gloves? Uh, I haven't looked at gloves, but um, yeah, I think that's the first thing. If Depending on where your hand position is, it's you exactly. know, definitely going to be the first thing that gets hit. So um, just as full sleeve skin suits seem to be faster than non, I would think that, yeah, that would, would play a little little part anyway. I read a study one time, I forget where it was, but they talked about how gloves had a much larger effect on your time than you thought they would because they were up front in the wind. And a lot of people have, you know, Velcro tabs hanging off and these big things that can catch the wind. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess I was thinking gloves versus no gloves. But if you have gloves that are flapping in the wind, then that's going to definitely be a different story. (laughs) Do you have any tips for cleaning up a bike for a race, like shortening cables, removing parts? Yeah, I mean, you kind of think about it like anything that is exposed in a cable is going to be a round tube, right? And so it's already not aerodynamic. And so, um, you know, any kind of cleanup and you see all the integrated bikes, you know, there's no cables anywhere, right? So, yeah. it is going to play a role, how much of a role, you know, the faster you go, the bigger role it plays. But, um, one of the things I like to do is I, I kind of like to look at, um, other areas of sport that are borrowing from cycling and vice versa. So if you look at, um, world cup and sailing, um, one of the things that, you know, or the, uh, New Zealand team did, um, team Emirates over, uh, the U S where they handily defeated the U S very easily is you look at every cable, you look at everything on the bike and it, I mean, everything on the boat and it is so aerodynamic because they're going yeah. 50 plus knots, right? It's uh, a, yes. Uh, I mean, it's huge. And even the, the winchers, so uh, anybody that doesn't know about like big boat sailing, you have these winchers that are grinding down these sails on each side. And so they have these big, like basically winches and one person takes one side, the other person takes the other side and they're just like going as hard as they can well, on their boat they switched to bike power. Um, so they didn't have, they weren't using arms. Wow. They would jump on a bike and it's a, in, and it basically looks like a team time trial. You have four, four guys down on a bike and they're winching using bike power and they're wearing aero helmets. They're all wow. streamlined down as low as they can Are get. Are you serious? Um, and it was inevitable, like on every single tack, they were just, I mean, every time they got going, they were just faster than the other. There, there was no way for the Americans to win because they were just faster because they're more That's aerodynamic. That's fascinating. Um, do those so boats, if you do get a chance, go take a look at their boat. And it is, is really cool. And they actually have a former uh, Olympic track cyclist on their team. So, And, and what boat is that again? Uh, team it's Emirates? the New Zealand, the Emirates, Team Emirates. 
So it's yeah. New Zealand boat, but it's team Emirates. Uh, Man, that sponsored. takes what we do and makes it look like, again, your math versus our math. Like that's such, <laughs> that's such a high level of perfection oh, that crazy. those guys hit. And but, the money I mean, in but that. it's really cool because they're they're borrowing from cycling, right? And then it's yeah, true. Yeah. And, and vice versa. I mean, we can use they spend twenty million plus on a boat design. <laughs> well, yeah. we can look at what they're doing, and they're they're kind of doing. So you you guys did a lot of CFD um, yep. in design your wheels. So they're doing a CFD model up top because the boat basically lifts up out of the water and is flying. And then a hydrodynamic model at the bottom. On the bottom, um, so yeah. It's, yeah, so it's a dual, you know, fluid model. Um, so, I mean, it's there's a lot of overlap in those two places that uh, maybe people don't <laughs> don't realize, but it's That's a really crazy. cool. That's so cool. So, one thing that I always kind of find funny when I go to a race is you'll see somebody come out of, you know, transition. They've got, like, the best bike, the best wheels, all the gear, and then they put on their race number and it's yeah. flapping around like a cape. Yeah. So it's not can, just, it's, it's not just <laughs> age groupers either. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what can you tell us about race numbers, where they should be placed? What's the best way to, to latch them down? Give us your, uh, your, and how, your, yeah, and how much of an effect is that you're required to wear it on Iron Man on the bike anymore? Um, no, cause you have them on your tube, but yeah, so right. how Iron much Man, of an effect? Anyway, problem solved. Don't wear it. <laughs> so don't you wear it. On. Um, yeah. So, I mean, flapping is bad so anytime you see anything <laughs> flapping it's not good um and you know i guess if you were to have to wear it you could either tuck it in tuck it in your shorts i think maca did that one year when it was still required in iron man yeah and he like just rolled it up and put it in his pants and like so you could do that or maybe get it as low as you can and sit on it i don't know like i mean um i think i <laughs> Joe Skipper a few years ago was at Roth or something and he sit there and it's like on the side of his side of his jersey is like not even behind him it was like cocked off to the side and just flapping for four and a half you know four <laughs> hours and ten minutes or whatever so Man, I was like some guys use that 3M adhesive spray okay there you go that would work they'll um, spray their kit and then they kind of just stick the number to them so there's no flapping at all yeah, i've seen so guys that do would that be, that races. would be a great idea yeah for sure i mean yeah you don't see it in cycling because you get to you know stick numbers anyway so exactly um, yeah no that totally makes sense okay all right let's go to race tips i remember i haven't raced for years now but i remember back when i was racing we talked about um i had a conversation with you about you know, you're in the aero position and that's really good for flat riding. But when you get to hills, sometimes it's just better to sit up. You can kind of move your weight around a little bit, especially on a TT bike. And it feels like you can get a little more power. And you told me that there's a specific speed where it's okay to sit up on a climb. Do you still believe in that? And if so, what yeah, is that I mean, speed? I think there's a range, right? So, and, and I've, I've given, a, I've flexed on this a little bit because, <laughs> because you start to look at it and go, okay, well... You know, at, at least at some level, you may have slightly different, you know, kind of power duration curve or whatever you want to call it for different positions. You Maybe you shouldn't have that, but, you know, just because of the way that you're riding and everything else, you may still be, um, get a little bit more power for the same, you know, physiological input in a different position. And so I think like there's a range somewhere between 12 miles an hour and, you know, 15 miles an hour where you know, sitting up is fine. And once you start getting over that, then, you know, then it's a, then you're giving up something. So you're giving up some aerodynamic time. Uh, so you want to make sure that you're gaining something. Maybe you're resting, maybe you're like able to get your heart rate down. Maybe you're doing something else. So anything, you know, above that 15 miles an hour, it's like, okay, I have to be, I'm losing time, but hopefully I'm compensating in some other way that I can make up for it later. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So just be, you know, I kind of say, just be cognizant of it. Like if it's, oh, if you're going this fast, um, and you're sitting up, you know, make sure you're either taking nutrition or you're doing something because, yeah. um, you're able to do something where you're not losing as much time as if you were sitting up on the downhill or whatever. Okay. So when you're in that range, you're, you're losing less time sitting up then. Exactly. So yeah. when you, if you need to sit up, do it, you know, 15 miles an hour or, or slower. Right. And so yep. if you're taking, or, you know, if you're, if you're, the other, you know, the other idea on that is, is if you're going downhill, um, and let's say you're, you're going to lose some time, but you're going faster too. So you can take drinks and stuff on the downhill sections, 
not lose as much time. Um, but you know, you're, you're also may not be able to take nutrition and stuff cause you're kind of trying to concentrate and things like that. Right, right, so, right. So, you know, so still goal one is always stay in the bars as long as you yeah, can. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So your system, I, the first time I looked at your system, it, it's, it's kind of cool that you can kind of, you almost say, how many intervals do I want? You have a way of kind of mm-hmm. saying, I want to hold one steady pace for the entire race. Now you also have a way that you can say, at this marker on the course, hold 300 watts from A to B. When you get to this marker on the course, dial back down to 280. When you get to this section, bump up to 320. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's all about pacing for a race. So in your opinion, what is the best way for athletes to pace for a race? And can you compare the steady average versus the varied watts in segments? Yeah. So, um, you know, there's kind of a old rule of thumb and I don't know where it started, but I know Joe Friel and I talked about it and it's something he, he always kind of, kind of mentions, you know, in terms of VI. So VI is the difference between an average power and a normalized power. Um, and for those of you that, that are kind of unfamiliar with those terms, average power is just the average of your power across the, the course and normalized power is, um, kind of estimates the physiological toll of the power you're putting out. So for instance, if you are doing really hard and then moderate and then really hard, then moderate your average, you know, maybe one thing, but those really hard efforts, um, actually increase your overall like fatigue level for that, for that same kind of ride. Okay. Um, and so VI is the difference between those two. And so his rule of thumb, um, is for pretty much 99% of all, courses and all triathlons and time trials, you should be below 1.05, um, or 1.05 or lower. There's some difference, you know, there's some places like, uh, Ironman France where you're not going to be able to do that or, uh, Ironman St. George or something where you have, uh, we had a lot of, a lot of, uh, elevation change. Um, it makes it a little trickier if it's really windy, it may be hard to do that as well. Um, so, but for the most part, um, you should be able to keep that. And that is a very fairly steady state ride. Um, you know, 1.0 would be perfectly steady state. So, um, the difference there is that you can get benefit from varying that a little bit. So, um, if I was to ride 200 Watts, the whole course, 200 Watts uphill, 200 Watts downhill, 200 Watts on the flat, um, my time's going to be different than if I still average 200 Watts, but maybe went to 20 on the uphill, 175 on the downhill, and then 195 on the flat. Um, and for every course, it's going to be different. So it's kind of hard to give a specific, this is the best, you know, strategy, um, for something like Kona, you know, maybe it's five minutes different. Um, but for something like Ironman Florida, there'll be zero difference because it's pretty much the strategy is to go the same, <laughs> the same power the whole way through, um, if, assuming the wind's kind of steady state. So, um, but yeah, I, I think like um, to try and answer your question, you know, anywhere from five to 10 to more minutes uh, by being able to vary your power and especially for the lower power athletes. So once you get to those lower power um, you're, you're kind of forced to have to go higher on the, on the climbs. Wow. So, so you can save that much more time by the varied versus the steady pace, five to 10 minutes. Yeah, for sure. That's awesome. Wow. Okay. So, and then you said, so the physiological requirement, my next question was about physiological requirement being equal. So you're saying as long as that variability index is 1.05 or lower, it has an almost similar or same, uh, physiological requirement on the body. Right. I mean, it's, it's pretty, yeah, yeah, pretty close. So what you would say is that, um, you know, for the same average power, so that, that's what you're looking at for the same average power, that's going to be 5%, you know, that 1.05 will be 5%. It'll feel 5% harder. Right. So, yeah. um, if you were looking at training peaks, we have training stress score. So if you're looking at that, it's going to be higher for the same effort. Um, so you do want to make sure you look at it and say, okay, um, am I able to, to maintain a good run off of the same kind of bike? Um, and I would say that the varied pace, um, you know, there's a mental thing to it as well. If you can get some variance and say, okay, for this next two miles, I just need to hold this. And then I get over, I get, I turn the corner and I've got a downhill. Okay. Now I can let off and I can do this. And then, so it gives you this like mental, like 
change stimulus yes. that's kind of nice. <laughs> you know, it's I funny you that. say that. I, I used to train with Angela Nath, and that girl... We would be climbing for, we trained in Vegas and there was these just giant hills and we would climb and climb and climb. And that girl never lets off the gas. And we would get to the top of these, when I first started training with her, we'd get to the top of these giant climbs. And I'm mm-hmm. like, thankfully, we could just take a second. She accelerates off the top and yeah, down the other side. And I'm like, <laughs> what is like, what is wrong with you? Like, it, it, oh, never have I ever met a person who accelerates after, you know, a, a 40 minute climb. I'm like yeah. this. Uh, anyway, but that's why she's one of the best in the world. So, um, okay. So quickly, what, what are, when it comes to pacing, mm-hmm. what are some of the biggest mistakes that athletes can make? I'm guessing it's that they're just all over the place, right? All over that yeah, 1.5. I mean, it, it, yeah, it's pretty interesting. It, you'll see... I think the biggest thing is kind of not knowing their, you know, not having a really good understanding of their capability and going out too hard. So yeah. everybody feels great coming out of the water, you know, specifically, well, actually time trial too. Everybody feels great coming out of the gate. Um, so being able to like hold back and realize that, okay, this is a long thing or this is a longer than for, you know, five minute type of race. So I need to like make sure that, have a plan going in. If I have a plan going in, I can deviate from it. But if I don't have a plan going in, then I'm just kind of like, I'm just going, I may go all out because I feel great at the beginning, but you probably are not going to feel great coming back you yeah. know, on that case. So, um, yeah, so I think that would probably be for amateurs. That's the biggest mistake I, I, I would make, um, in the past. And, um, so I think that that's another, that's probably the biggest one. The second one is going too hard on hills not spinning enough. So that'll, that's what they kind of call VI buster. So like you'll get out there, <laughs> you know, you'll hammer that hill kids. You gotta, you gotta keep going fast. Uh Oh, I'm not going 20 miles an hour anymore. I better just go as hard as I can. Um, and you're not going to feel it the first hill, but you're going to feel it the fifth hill. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. um, so I think like you, you see that. And then finally I would say gearing, um, you have a lot of people, especially low power riders, like the way bikes are sold today, you know, it's, it's getting better because you, you'll see a lot of bikes coming with compact chain rings now. Um, but for low power athletes, you just don't have the right gearing um, to be able to uh, spin and and keep your power in check on 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 climbs. So I never thought yeah. of that. That's an interesting point. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, and we we had, we had thought about trying to do gear ratios and, and putting them on the on the site, and we're still. It's still on our dev board, but it just hasn't been touched in a while. But I, I do think it's really important. And, and we see a lot of athletes where, you know, if your FTP is 160 or, uh, you know, so you're kind of one hour power ish around one hour power. Yeah. <laughs> is, yeah. yeah uh, 160. FTP. Yeah. Um, you know, and you're, you're going these hills and you, you run out of gears, you can't spin. So you have to just push hard. So, um, so you see athletes like that really struggling to get under a, a 1.1 VI. Um, whereas if their gearing was set up, um, then you would be able to spin and, and still kind of like keep your, keep your power in check. Yeah. On the, on the That's course. really cool. Cause I, you know, I, <laughs> my FTPs always floated around 300 and I weigh 155 pounds. So like, I've, I've never thought of that, but you take a, I mean, and, and the, the number isn't really important. You can have women in Kona who weigh 95, hundred pounds mm-hmm. who are some of the best athletes in the world, but as a result, because they're so light, they have a low power. Yep. So that really comes into play for them. You know, that's, that's a yeah. really interesting concept. Huh. Crazy. Um, okay. We have a couple follower questions that people have, have asked about. So you see in the pro field, uh, you're not allowed to draft, but <laughs> pros um, have that 10 to uh-huh. 20 meter buffer, right? It's, a, it's usually 10 meter buffer. Mm-hmm. So that's legal. Um, I've heard from some of the guys that I've talked to that that is a massive benefit. So how many Watts is legal drafting worth? You take the guy at the front versus the guy in the third or fourth position in the line. Sure. Um, I think the best, most recent best example of this, actually there, well, both 70.3s, uh, world champs were pretty good examples of this. The, uh, Last year, not so, not as much, um, because you had this huge climb at the beginning that kind of broke everything up. But if you look at um, the pro field at the seventy dot three worlds in Australia, and you had I think twenty athletes coming out, coming in within ten seconds or thirty seconds of each other off the yep. bike. Um, 
and so we had data from from several of those athletes. We won't go into it names and stuff, but um, from athletes out front, athletes chasing, and athletes kind of in between. Um, and the power in certain sections. So in a tailwind, it's not really going to play much of a factor. A little bit because they're going so fast. Uh, sure. In a crosswind, you're not going to have really any impact. Um, so a majority crosswind, it's very negligible impact on a hill. It's going to be negligible. Um, but into a headwind, um, and kind of, especially a flat headwind, um, we were looking at, uh, let's see, basically the difference between a 0.23 and a 0.2, uh, flat. So if I wow. look at Whoa. the percentages there. So what? That's what you're, you're uh, like, So yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to look at what the wattage difference is. It's like an hour, I mean, right? It, it was I mean, like 40 watts or something like that. So, Whoa. Um, let's see here. Well, 40 so, watts. So what you're saying is there's hope for a guy like me. I might, <laughs> if I got in the right position, I might feel the right position. And the right wind. And so that's the other thing is the wind has to be like, you know, kind of in your favor or whatever as well. But um, yeah, so let me see what that was. Oh, yeah. So that's... So, okay. So yeah, it, I mean, somewhere between, yeah, 20 watts almost, something like that. So. Okay. Wow. So not quite That's that amazing. Okay. Um, another yeah. really, another really interesting question that came in and it, it kind of relates to this is you, you've got people who go out to races and their goal is just to finish the race. And that's, that's awesome. They can follow their own pacing plan and everything's great. But then you've got professional athletes and you've got age group racers who are looking to get podium spots, maybe to qualify for Kona. And a lot of times those athletes are so similar in ability that they come out of the water together mm -hmm. and then they kind of end up riding in packs. And if your race strategy says, hold this wattage here and there or whatever, that's one thing. But if the pack surges and the pack goes, how do athletes adapt to that when their wattage or their, their race plan says something otherwise? Yeah. And then that's the difference between, you know, somebody that's trying to PR or go against themselves versus somebody who's racing. Right. So for okay. the tactics start to come into play. So then what you look at is, you know, you kind of have to do almost a deeper level of analysis. Um, I would say beforehand in your prep and say, okay, let me look at this athlete and say, and, and we actually did some of this at Kona this past year where somebody, you know, Lionel Sanders was going to come charging through the field with, um, others. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. <laughs> if you have him and Kinley going through the field and Cameron Wharf and those guys, and they're just going to blast through, um, should you go, should you go with them or should you not? And, uh, one of them that didn't go with them this year was Patrick Lange, who ended up winning. Um, and so, you know, he rode to his ability and steady, um, and didn't surge when the surge came through. Um, whereas others who did surge, uh, <laughs> did not fare too well. <laughs> yeah. Back. Right. He, now, he, so, but that's, a, you know, that's, that's Kona. That's its own kind of beast at other races. You know, you may have to go, but it, it comes down to if you are going at a 0.9 intensity, meaning like 90% of your, your FTP, you can only sustain that for so long. So if you, if some of these athletes that FTP is up at 410 or whatever Sanders is at now, you know, oh if you're gosh. at 380, you know, you, you can't hold it. So you, <laughs> you know, you have to hope that like you've gotten enough cushion in the swim. You may be able to surge at the right time and, and keep up for a little bit and minimize the losses, but then, you know, you've got to pick it up, um, where your strengths lie. Or, or you have arguably the, you know, the best run triathlon has ever seen like Patrick. Right. Exactly. And, but he knew, <laughs> yeah. he knew he had the run in him and if he had gone with him, then that run may not have been there. Right. So, yeah. Right. Crazy. Um, so you kind of look at that and say, okay, you, you pick your battles and, and, so if you know, but if you know the course and you know the wind conditions and you know some other things, you can say, well, maybe I'll surge a little bit here and push myself a little bit out of my comfort zone, knowing that maybe I've got a little 10 meter, somewhat, you know, 20 watt, 30 watt advantage here. So they're holding 310. Maybe I can hold 280 for a little while here um, and, and kind of stay in. But then, you know, if the conditions are such that now you start to notice, uh oh, I'm pushing to 300. 
this is way out of my comfort zone, then you, you know you kind of have to back off. You got to play um, smart. Yep. Yeah. And that's cool. where those, yeah, all the tactics come into play. And, um, and Worf played it really interestingly, you know, he, uh, former pro cyclist and, and really, really, really strong. Um, and he made the move coming back of a Javi in the crosswinds because he knew there is no advantage, right? There's yep. no advantage right. for somebody sitting 10, 10 meters off of me. So I'm not going to let anybody even, you know, try. So just hit it in the crosswinds. Smart, man. Smart. So so we started this episode with introducing Ryan as somebody that's into software. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. I remember when Chris and I first started Flowback in probably 2011. It was shortly after that, this guy, Ryan Cooper, reached out to me. And I was like, who's this guy? You know, and <laughs> he sounded like he, he had some something going on. He knew what he was talking about. So we cr- we've created a relationship. Ryan and us have been buddies for, for a number of years. Uh, he's very, very modest. Um, but the stuff that he does with software, as we said, is, is in my opinion, the, the most advanced that is out there today. Um, I remember just a quick story. We used to sponsor a pro, uh, Chris and I, good guy named Josh Allberger. And I remember he was ra- uh, racing, uh, it was 70.3 worlds in Las Vegas. He was out staying with us and Ryan sent out a tweet and it was like, oh, I predict these times and Josh Omberger, I predict this time. And Josh Omberger was there and he looked at Chris and I, he's like, who bleep is this guy? What does he think he knows about my cycling? And I'm like, and I was like, well, you know, that's, that's Ryan Cooper. And he's like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. So I remember, and not, not giving Josh a hard time. He's a good guy, but he was just, he's like, how could this even be possible? And I remember we went down to the race that day. Josh went through his race and he, he got off the bike and he finished the race. He came in, he's looking through his files and he looks at his, his, his garment. And he's like, <laughs> Ryan was three seconds off my time on the bike. And I'm like, yeah. He's like, who is this guy? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it's like, yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. Um, but anyway, one thing that we've noticed and, and back when we first started, you know, doing a lot of the design work, everything that we were doing, um, sort of started with us looking at software and that software for us was computational fluid dynamics software because it was much more affordable than wind tunnels. You can turn prototypes faster, et cetera, et cetera. You move out to the next generation of our wheels and, you know, we collected measurements on course to then, you know, use super computers to, to optimize things even more. Um, my belief is, is that eventually uh, software is sort of going to overtake some of the traditional methods that we use. So in, in some of our most recent blog posts, uh, you know, Ryan has helped us and we'll look at time savings over a course with our wheel. So, you know, there's there's a number of ways you can calculate this. You can take a wheel, you can put it in a wind tunnel, you can see the, the savings that it makes, and then you can say, well, this is what it will save you over a course. However, because of what you can get at a software now, we can get a, batch, a much clearer picture. So, Ryan, I just wanted to ask you and, and see where you think software will eventually take us and how that will either overtake traditional testing or do you think it will marry together and make it better? Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a marriage, um, at least to, in the short term. Um, you know, it, Real testing is still going to be done, um, but I think the the software side, some of the biggest benefits of that are being able to um, try so many different combinations of things without having to right. spend the time, uh, the cost of it, the, um, you know, in terms of the athletes, the training cost of it. You lose, you know, X number of days training, you know, testing different things and different options and looking at this versus that. And you know, for at the pro level, um, and even at the age group level, you know, lost days of training when you're, when you're trying to get a goal is, is kind of a big deal. So, um, yeah, I think that what we'll start to see, and we're starting to see it now is you have, I mean, how many players in this aerodynamic testing field are there going to be in the next two years? Uh, Garmin bought Alpha Mantis and that's yep. kind of an aeropod type of thing. Um, there's, there's a thing called Aeropod that I just read about yesterday yep. <laughs> from Swiss. Out of Canada. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a, there's a 3d modeling system, STAC. And I talked to them yesterday. I think I'm going to have a prototype thing coming, but, um, and theirs is, is kind of a 3d model that you actually do CFD on. So it's a 3d model of you on the bike. Um, yep. and one of the things they're working on is being able to articulate 
and change your your hand hand positions, head position, switch different types of helmets on and off of you. And so then you kind of have your 3D model that you can then adapt and try different things with. Um, yep. And then animate it as well because you'll start to see some, some different numbers uh, when your wheels are moving. Um, so, you know, I think that it's going to head that way and – and, but in the, you know, real testing is still going to be used to validate most things, at least in the short term. Right. Exactly. Nice. Awesome. All right, Ryan, uh, last question. Um, on this show, we have something called Watt points and we ask every person that we interview, if they follow the advice on the show, how many Watts can that save them? And okay. I think your episode is going to win hands down on All the right. number of Watts that we can save. Um, but really, we talked a lot about optimization today and what athletes can do to save time by changing position and gear and optimizing things. So I'm going to ask you to try and generalize this and give yeah. me a range, but let's take an athlete. Uh, we always use a 300 watt FTP. An athlete's got a 300 watt FTP and they, they don't follow any of your advice. They're road bike. Perfect. They're, they're not doing this. They're not doing that. And then you get them into a good position. Uh, they, they follow a race plan, all of those things. Um, how many watts is that worth? Sorry, I have to get my, my pen and paper out real quick. You know what? Every every time I ask this question, people are like, they freak out because it's a range and numbers and they don't know it. Oh, but no, you're, okay. you're like, you got <laughs> the calculator excited. ready. You're excited. This, yeah, is, ready. this is so great. <laughs> so I'm going to, oh, yeah. So I'm going to say that this athlete is road bike, everything bad, right? So, yep. Yep. So we want to say what, how many watts we're going to save? 300 watt FTP. 300 watt FTP. All right. So let's see what we can do with them. And we'll say triathlete, <laughs> right? Yep. We yep. won't go extreme time trials. Yep. This is we'll great. a little generous on it. So. Okay. <laughs> we are going to save this person. All right. Here we go. We're going to save them 60 watts. Oh, <laughs> oh man. That's amazing. I mean, that's like that. You could just eat Oreos for a season, you know, and, <laughs> and come back at the same amount. That's that's pretty crazy. Cool, oh, man. Awesome. Well, yeah. this has been honestly one of our our most interesting episodes. This is awesome. I we wanted to have you on the show from the minute we thought about it, and we can't thank you enough for being on the show. Uh, where can people learn more about you, all your awesomeness, and all of that stuff? Oh man. Uh, well, they can learn more about Best Bike Split at bestbikesplit.com. Um, also, if you're a Training Peaks user or non-user, go to trainingpeaks.com for all of your um, kind of data analysis and planning and structured training needs. Um, but yeah, for for everything geeky and aerodynamics, um, you know, Best Bike Split is kind of the place to go. I think uh, awesome. some of those things we're going to do in the future around. Um, using data to, to kind of fine tune aerodynamics is going to be right up, uh, you know, right up your alley and in your listeners and customers alley for sure. Awesome. Man. Perfect. Well, thank you for the show. We'll definitely be back to the party in Kona this year for that, uh, poke from the poke sure. sack <laughs> and, uh, we'll be good. All right, buddy. Thanks. Awesome. Good catching up and thank you so much. Thank you so thanks. much. Appreciate yep. it. Thank you for listening to this episode. Be sure to listen to episode 13, where we interview Dr. Steven Seiler, the founder of the Polarized Training Method, to learn how polarized training can help you become a faster cyclist. If you enjoyed the show, please help us by sharing our podcast and by leaving a rating or review. If you want to learn more about our company, Flow Cycling, please visit us online at flowcycling.com. That's F as in Frank, L O C Y C L I N G dot com. You can also find us under Flow Cycling on Facebook and Instagram. Until next time, ride safe. <laughs>